ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and everybody in between. Welcome to another episode of the Chaps Chat Cats, a part of the Hoops Crew Media Network. My name's Jake. And I'm joined in the virtual studio by two guys who you might see picking up rubbish on the side of the road in high vis in a city near you. Uh, Sambo and Johnny, how are you, chaps? Uh, good. Wondering what's on the horizon for my future that you've seen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Crystal ball of some kind. Uh, I know what I'm going <laughs> to do yeah. to lose my job I and have, I have be picking up rubbish. But impeccable I'm looking overall forward record. <laughs> Nary a demerit point upon my license, I'll have you. You have it loose, Sam. Uh, let's... A what? <laughs> a lot to... <laughs> a lift I have with A you. lot to get into. <laughs> on the show tonight if my internet holds out currently hiding out here in uh, the deepest reaches of siberia um no i'm not responsible for the tom morris leaks i'm having to hide for whole other reasons um but yes let's get into it chaps we've got Cats v. Schwanz, uh, round 13 recapped. We're going to dissect that, going to chop it up, take various cutting implements to it, pull it apart, really get into the gizzards of it. Uh, and then we're going to duck behind the Patreon curtain and do our weekly burlesque foot show uh, for all our Patreon subscribers. And after we do that, we're going to talk a little bit about the statistical performance of four Cats midfielders as compared to last week against the Tigers. Not to try and take a scalpel to them, but just to say, hey, this is what they did against the Tigers. This is how they performed this week. What was the difference? What did we see? What did we think? Plus, we'll get into a whole bunch of other stuff, most likely, as we gas bag on. But before we get into the show, we have to do a couple of quick bits of business. First off, chaps, you don't have to fall in battle and be carried off by winged warrior women anymore to reach the halls of Valhalla. All you got to simply do is get down to G-Town and get yourself along to the brew hall of Valhalla Brewing in uh, North Geelong. Get along to the Tippity Tap Tap Room in the CBD. Valhalla Brewing, of course, sponsoring the Hoops Crew Media Network, and we thank them immensely, gratefully, gratuitously for their support of our work. Let's dive into it, chaps. I'm going to give us a quick recap, then we're going to get into our thoughts. The Cats started like an absolute house on fire. They finished like one, two, but in a slightly different way. Um, they <laughs> kicked the first five goals of the game. Five, two, 32 to three behinds at quarter time. It happened in a flourish. Brian Myers after four and a half minutes. Jack Bowes after six minutes. Goals to Tom Hawkins at the 11-minute mark and Tyson Stengel at the 13-minute mark. And Tyson Stengel again at the 23-minute, 43-second mark. They would kick. The sixth goal of the game as well to Shannon Neal after 12 minutes of the second quarter. But there were storm clouds brewing on the horizon at the SCG for Geelong's hopes of victory. As the Sydney Swans piled on five goals in the space of 10 minutes. It was Joel Amadi after 14 minutes. It was Hayward after 16 and a half. It was Chadley Warner the third after 20 minutes and 19 seconds. It was Isaac Heaney after 22 and a half minutes. And it was Isaac Heaney again after 23 minutes, 50. There was a patch there, chaps, where it seemed like the ball was bounced and then they'd score and then we'd bounce the ball and then they'd score and then we'd bounce the ball and then they'd score and then they'd bounce the ball and then they'd score. Halftime interrupted that. Geelong still clinging to a 6-5-41 to 5-6-36 lead. And God bless them, they actually came out the gate, got the first goal of the second half, Tyson Stengel, after 53 seconds. Thereafter, though, it was a bit of a bit of a battle. Joel Amadol to bring the Swans within 
closing distance of us. There was a rush behind to the Swans, a behind to James Jordan, another rush behind. The Cats kicked away with a goal to Brad Close. Sydney brought it straight back with Joel Amati. A flurry of behinds to the Cats, misses to Grian Myers, Max Holmes, and a rush behind. And then an avalanche of red and white began across the next probably 40-ish minutes of game time. Well, less than that, actually. There was a goal to Tom Papley at the 26-and-a-half-minute mark of the third term. Another goal to Tom Papley at the 28-minute, 49-second mark. And then it was half time, uh, three-quarter time. The Swans leading 9-13-67 to 8-8-56. They kicked the first two goals of the final quarter. In fact, they kicked the first... Four of the first five goals of the final term to blow the margin out to 30 points. But this Cats team, resilient enough to kick three goals in a row to Jeremy Cameron, Max Holmes, and Jack Bowes in the space of about six minutes to close the game back to just around a two-goal margin. Now, thereafter, they had a couple of chances didn't capitalize. The Swans hit them hard the other way with three goals to close the game. Chadley Warner, the third, kicking a goal after 27 minutes. Thomas Papley, the 18th, and Errol Golden, both goaling. Before the final siren sounded, the Swans getting it done 16-16, to 12-10-82, a 30-point victory for the latter leaders, leaders, the 2024 reigning premier, Sydney Swans. Tyson Stengel, three goals, one. Jeremy Cameron, two goals straight. Jack Bowes, two goals, one. For the Swans, it was Papley, four goals, one. Amadi, three goals, two. And Warner, two straight disposals for the Cats. Max Holmes, 23. Holmes, Jeremy Cameron with 20 touches. Tom Atkins with 20. For the Swans, it was Errol Golden, 37. Chadley Warner, the third with 26. And I, Zach. Heaney with 26. Sambo, I'll go to you first. Your general thoughts, takeaways, and feelings and emotions on the game. Oh, yeah. I mean, bit of a bit of a roller coaster. Um I I said early, I said pretty early to you to you, Jake. Uh, we watched the game uh side by side. And I, I did say in that first quarter, maybe early into the second, I said, even if this is all we get out of this game, because uh, Sydney will come, I said, even if this is all we get, I've got to be happy with this, at the uh, with what we've seen at the end of the day. And I'll be honest, I wasn't super happy with <laughs> at the end of the day, but I do have to stick to uh, stick to my word and and look at it from that perspective that I wasn't trying to be doom and gloom and go, oh, but we're not good enough to win. I still very much thought we would and should win that game. Um, but on the off chance, we didn't. And I just knew that Sydney would, you know, I mean, they're, it's not an accident where they are this year. I knew they'd bring something to the table. Um, so, you know, in, in a lot of ways, there's, there is still a lot of positives to come out of it, as much as everyone wants to blame the buy and act like the first quarter didn't count. But, you know, Apparently the first quarter is all that counted when we played Richmond because everyone everyone <laughs> everyone said once we came and won, oh, oh, but Richmond nearly had him. No one's saying, oh, oh, but Geelong nearly had him. Yeah, so like, anyway, <laughs> a little bit about the uh, the media narrative around this. Um, but what's new? That's that's, that's where I live, being bitter about the media. Of course, in the meantime, every three months, a person is torn to pieces by a crocodile in North Queensland. It's very true. Thanks for keeping me on track, Bob. Uh, I, I think the real, uh, the real crux of it is that I think the breakdowns, and we'll get into it a bit more. I think the breakdowns in defensive structure hurt us again, um, and I think our delivery inside fifty, once the pressure was on, also really fell apart. Um, we were getting so many good goals from so many different spots from a spread of players. Uh, and then I felt like once the pressure was on, we were just kicking it uh, straight towards Jeremy Cameron or Tom Hawkins in a one v two, hoping that they'd pull some magic out. Like there was a f- there was a few times. This is to say we were the better team. We should have won. This is all part of being a good team. Just like kicking efficiency, just like you know, efficiency inside fifty is part of being a team. Um, there's a few instances there when we were watching and we we're going, Duncan, Duncan, Duncan is running through the middle. He's edge of the fifty. He's 45 out. 
He's 35 out with his arms in the air, no one on him, and they would kick it to try and get give Cameron or Sting a mark without a, a favourable lead. Like, I think that vision, I think our midfielders, our young guys, Dempsey and the like, they are really coming along. But I think that still, when they're confident and they're up and about, their ceiling is really high. Uh, and then when, when the other team is the heat, they're, they're, that final disposal sort of starts to betray them a little bit. They start looking, understandably so, they start looking for those superstars when it's not necessarily them that's in the in the in the driver's seat, you know, in the optimum position. So I think those there's a lot going on in a football game, but those two things that break down in inside our fifty, our defensive fifty, uh, and then that sort of final delivery into theirs were, were the key things, but a lot to like. There was that first quarter, you know, like I said, if that's all we got, it almost was. Um that was brilliant. That was, you know, shade, shades of the best the Cats have been for 10 years, let alone going back to the first seven games. Like, that was, it was dominant. It was just, they were so well set up behind the ball and off the ball. They moved it so well. Um, they, they brought each other into the game, but were also backing themselves enough to have a shot. That also went away towards the end of the game. The pressure was on. No one wanted to take the game on their shoulders. Gary Rowan kicked it off a couple of times. Tom Hawkins kicked it off when he when he could have squared someone up. Um, yeah, there was, there was a few times when you we just felt like no one wanted to sort of take that shot. Um, and and so those were another of the things that went went a bit sideways. But that first quarter was about as good as I've seen the Cats. And if we can play like that for two, three quarters, I think we'll, we we'd be good enough to beat anyone. It's just getting that to happen. Yeah, it's interesting on Twitter. I, I was expecting, uh, you know, a high amount of doom and gloom, and the, and the, look, there was some, but to be honest, like there were actually quite a few people who were impressed by the effort, uh, and that that sort of stunned me. I think there were a few mm. people who had a, a bit of perspective um, on, on was, the challenge that was in front of the cats. There was one guy that came out. Uh, I saw him post and say. Uh, this was on Instagram on a, on a comment on a post from the Geelong Instagram page. And he said, I'm done. He's, he's like, that's it for me. I'll come back when we're going to print again. And the encouraging thing was how piled on he got. Everyone <laughs> just jumped on and were like, we don't want fans like you, so please don't come back. And <laughs> just like everybody just yeah. tore him to absolute pieces. So that was, that was actually good to see. Not for him, but for the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's a ridiculous. It's such a ridiculous point of view to hold. Um, totally Johnny, you. I'll come to, you, to your thoughts. Did you have any yep. takeaways, feelings from the game? Any sort of yeah? How did you come away from this game feeling? Oh well, you know, at the end of the day, Swans were just too good for us. Completely, utterly thrashed us in every single possible state could think of. Any like clearances, everything. They were just too good. Totally thrashed us in every area of the game. And, you know, you know I'm going to be the doom and gloom guy. You know, I've had enough now. I've got to change teams. Getting rid of the bloody cat stuff. Done. What are we doing with this, this club anymore, huh? <laughs> it's, it's, you know, we've, we've, suffering, we've suffered long enough since the last premiership. It's bullshit. And, you know, I'm just, I'm just over it. You know, you need to give. You need to make some major changes. It's been a long two years. It's been a long time. Premiership. That's why you know you've, you've got to got to make some changes. So I've just got to change team myself if they're not willing to make changes. But this team, you know, future champions. If you're not a champion supporting person, then what are you? You're nothing. So you know, it was a good game by the Swans at the end of the day, and you know we splashed your mob, <laughs> came away really good. Looking fantastic, eleven one on top of the ladder. Feels good to be back on that winning list and not yeah, suffering really the, to the down the, <laughs> down in the that, dumps. That shuts us up, yeah. What down in the bottom half of the eight, like you know, suffering major ball sacks and all that. So bring on, yeah. bring on this new new colours, red and white, up the swans. Yeah, fair enough. Well, well, that's, look, uh, totally right. understandable. Yeah. I think I think I've got a 
I, like as a friend, I just have to accept this. Like it is yeah. hard. It's been a hard, it's been a long, torturous 18 months. John, you've made the sensible decision to jump onto the 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 boys from the uh the harbor. And yep. um we just respect that. Is that you true? and our, our swan supporter. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I didn't realize. Can I get you to up that comment it. online? I didn't. Re- I didn't realize it was John. I'll be honest. I, I'm. I've seen the light now. Now that I know it was you, John, and I know the com- the context that you come from, I understand. I understand a lot more, yeah. and I'm. I'm sorry that we all piled on you like that. It's, it's no, no. I'll bring wrong. bring it on. You know, it's you know just salty cats fans, as they say. You know, you yeah, just you know, it's sour that your team's losing, and you got a coach that's no good. <laughs> Maybe to send him off to Brisbane or something like that. Get rid of him, or you know, it's true. Was, was he it's brought to you? Yeah, was he brought to this club? Unlike Johnny um, Longmire. Well, as premiership, as, as a couple of losses. I mean, you're you're finals. you're our like one of our oldest friends, and I'd still like to have you on the podcast. So even though you are now our resident Sydney Swans fan, uh, Johnny Swanee Larkin. Um, yeah. can you maybe do you want to pose the questions tonight to Sam and I? I'll um, pose a we're prepared to to suffer through this nuclear winter um, of a 2024 cat season, you know, we find ourselves bereft at eight and five having, you know, John, it's a long, it's been a long frozen tundra of 18 months without the cats lifting that premiership cup. So I handball to you now, John, um, to ask some questions uh, of us so we can, I mean, you didn't get to watch the game no, either. That was, that was another thing. You were stuck at work, the stuck Kings work, weekends. Waving away. The King's uh, birthday, uh, not just the King's, King's weekend. Um, <laughs> the King's, the King's Free weekend, birthday the King's weekend. weekend. If you're the King, uh, well, I, feel I like really King's didn't know that it was El- Elvis. That's what birthday. hurts the most as well. Um, I couldn't win <laughs> on my um, birthday, even though it wasn't on my birthday. Yeah. It was a day after, but you know, still. But your team, your team did win on my birthday, so, so it's all right. They, they did. My previous team didn't. This new team, they did. <laughs> So I'm feeling so much better now. I feel like I've got a good Christmas present for my birthday present, my 34th birthday and and all that. So um, first question is, how do you feel about um, the best celebrator in the game when he, you know, kicks four on you, <laughs> waggles that finger, running around, tongue out? Can't really. Yeah. How do you, how do you plan on stopping that next time you to meet this team in the near future? Yeah, I mean he is good. I think well, I mean that one's a, he, everyone knows he's a he's a good uh, celebrator. I think the one you laid out is really good, John. I think my personal favorite is the one where he sticks his finger out and runs around with his tongue out. Um, that's the, oh, my yeah. personal preference. Everyone's got their own. What about you, Jay? Which one? Which one of Tom Papley's amazing celebrations? Do you prefer? It's hard to pick. Um, I reckon I'd have to go the one where he kicks the goal and then he runs around. Waving his finger with his tongue sticking out. Yeah. I reckon that's it's a good one. That's 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 a good one. Yeah, that's right. It's we can we can all disagree. Um, we can all disagree on on my favourite one is one where he kicks a goal, runs around, wagging his finger, <laughs> tongue out, and then then there's a hot far high ten to a teammate. Oh, yeah, that's the one. That's yeah. like, sometimes he just goes a high five or, or or a hug at the end. You know, he, yeah. such is his creative genius. You just don't know how he's gonna how he's gonna tie a bow in that beauty. But you don't see many I, cat you know, players celebrating that way. Like who? Who? No one thinks of that. It's such no, a clever, no. ingenious way. Um, we'd yeah. have to have kicked a Finger goal up. in the second half to celebrate, John. Yeah. Um, <laughs> another Sorry, uh, another favorite of mine. I've got to say with Papley is the variation where he kicks the goal. And he sticks his tongue out and waves his finger, but he starts it low at around knee height oh, and then brings it up. Brilliant really height. Really yeah. Yeah, yeah. My probably are there my any old, others in the Arsenal? My favorite like? one was when he when he did it on the grand final. <laughs> so a lot of yeah. talk has been made about your uh, failing midfield and the inability to win clearances. Is it time that you guys finally relent and bring in Mitch Hardy from that BFL side that you're refusing to elevate and just you know let him suffer dully in the um, BFL? You know, we'll take you. Take him off your hands if you like, and we'll make a good player out of him. Oh, I think he's too old to go to the footy academies. Um, 
I don't know. What did you think about the mid? Like, what did you think about the mid Sambo? Like, we'll probably talk a bit about it in the Patreon section. I've been spun for a loop. I don't even know if John will join us in the Patreon section at this point. But I'll um, I'll there was a, there was a, a drop off, obviously, um, from what they did against the Tigers. But then there was a massive up kick in opposition. I like. I thought Tom Atkins, like people hung a lot of crap on Atkins after the game, as per usual. Um, but again, it was sort of a 50-50 split from where I could see on Twitter. But like a lot of people pointed to the five free kicks, but he also led the Cats um, in effective disposals. He had 16 of his 20 disposals as effective. He led the Cats with tackles with seven. He led them for pressure act. He had, I think, a couple of goal assists. I I thought Atkins was decent. Um, I don't think it's his best game, but I a point uh, you you might have specific midfield points you want to chat about, Sambo. But something I keep thinking about is Tom Stewart's impact. And I thought in the first quarter there were times where I was like, "Oh, we've got we've got Stewie back to his best," and it. It didn't feel like a coincidence to me that Stewie looked back to normal and the Cats looked back to normal. And then I thought across the course of that second quarter and as the game wore on, that they shut Stewart down. I don't think it gets talked about enough that, you know, just because Stewart's form has dropped off or been curbed, however you want to sort of phrase it, doesn't mean his importance to what Geelong does have been lessened like we can we can point to the midfield and say how you know how badly they got touched up in whatever area you want but it makes a massive difference like I think Tom Stewart people have said Jeremy Cameron's our most important player I think Tom Stewart's been our most important player for years and I, I think they said something it was David King I think on commentary said when Stewart turned it over late in the game, he was like, oh, you just don't see Tom Stewart take risks like that. And I said to you, that's a load of rubbish. You see Tom Stewart take risks like that all the time. The difference is normally he makes the kick and Geelong benefit greatly from him having bitten off a kick that no one else would even attempt. The difference is at the moment, he's just, he's not playing to his usual level. He's not being allowed to play to his usual level. And I, I just thought you saw a really stark difference when he was up and about and the cats were up and about. And I, I just don't think that was a coincidence that, that when Stuart was playing well, Geelong were playing well in the first quarter. What, what, what are your sort of thoughts on that in the midfield? Yeah, I agree. That seems to be a real compounding issue with Stuart. That really hurt us. Obviously, I was talking about the, the back one structure. Uh, and then like some of their free loose players around stoppage, especially in our back 50. Um, and I wonder, I don't know enough, you know, about how they're moving the magnets around, but I do wonder if it's getting tagged and if there's some kind of game plan where someone goes to the tagger that's tagging Stuart and they try and outnumber that player to free Stuart. But what that was actually doing was then allowing another Sydney player to, to creep down unopposed because uh, Warner and Heaney were wandering around, especially in those sort of patch, patches where Sydney were dominant. Um Warner and Heaney are sometimes wandering around with without a direct opponent. Like probably the two best players that you want to be that way <laughs> anywhere near our defensive fifty. Um, and so this is just purely theoretical here. I don't know that could be people, you know, not st- sticking with their man. But I do wonder if there's if that was the result of them trying to to free up Stewart. I mean, they're trying to trying to d- double team Stewart's tagger to to create an outnumber when it when Stewart is brought into the game or something like that. Um, I don't think the midfield was like as good as they were against Tigers. Obviously, you said Jake, you know, it's a it's an uptick in opposition. Um, I don't think Atkins was that bad. I don't think anyone covered themselves in glory. But to pin it on Atkins is rough when he was probably the best of the bunch in that midfield. I mean, Holmes had a really good game, but Holmes probably only played maybe forty percent of it in the midfield. He still started and played a fair bit of down back from to my eye uh, in the halfback. So 
yeah, depending on Atkins, he's a bit rough when he was probably the one putting in the most consistent effort. Um, but if you look at the clearances, we only got beaten in center clearances by one. It was really the, the stoppage clearances where we got smashed, and the stoppage is all around the ground. So again, to pin that on the midfield when some of those stoppages are going to be in our forward and our back lines. Um, but then to look at the center clearances, and, which are, funnily enough, exclusively in the center, <laughs> and then we only get beaten by one one there. So again, it looks to me more like it's an overall around the ground um, response to stoppages that that's sort of letting us down. Um, and I wonder if that's structure. I do wonder if it's just those sort of ground ball gets that Sydney are so good at um, that were sort of leaving us in the in the dust a little bit. Um, like I think, yeah, with those with those stoppages in our back line. Uh, our our back line is quite tall and very good at intercepts and so, and not as good at at crumbing the ball and you know if the if the ball comes down from a from a hit out in the in the back um you know I thought we really struggled with that a little bit but it, I wouldn't I wouldn't pin the whole thing on the midfield and the ruck situation which is what everyone else wants to talk about we did get beaten in the midfield and we did get beaten in the ruck, but not so comprehensively to the point where that's where the game was lost. Um, if our back line is structured up and on point, then losing the center clearance or lo- losing, you know, losing a, cl- uh, a clearance um, at a stoppage shouldn't be as much of an issue. We should be able to turn it over. And I don't think our midfields, um, you know, offensive play, is really out of touch. Like I think, I think especially not when the when you know um, getting it up to the fifty. You know, I was talking about the the final the sort of before. But if our turnover game was on in the back line, I don't think it's as much of an issue, which is what was happening earlier in the year. Our midfield, our midfielders were pretty similar, but our turnover game from the back half was so good, it didn't matter. We got some goals and some attacks from stoppage and center clearance, but then the bulk of it came from turnovers in our back line. But that game has really dropped off, and that's sort of what's really hurting us at the moment. And I think it gets pinned on the midfield because it looks like they've dropped, but they're actually doing almost what we want. Not the, like I'm not saying it's perfect. They're not doing it at the level that we need them to do it yet. But if our back line can structure up and um, intercept and... Turn, turn, turn the ball over. I think, I think we're still okay, but there was just far too much of that finding a free Sydney player thirty-five out. Um, which, yeah, I don't, I don't know enough about what's happening off camera. You know, off the broadcast when you're not watching it live, it's very hard to see exactly what's going on there. And yeah, the broader media won't talk about it because they're just talking about work, things like work, work ethic, and work rate, and the midfield, and Reece Stanley. I, I just before Johnny throws us another another question, I just say something that I noticed yeah. in the second qu- quarter a, a lot was Sydney players running really hard ahead of the ball, and, and they were moving, they were moving the ball on quickly, but they were running hard in attack to create those waves of players ahead of the footy and, and sort of breaking us up that way like you didn't see that much at all i thought our uh, tackling pressure dropped off at times in the game mm. or i'm what i might say actually is i thought that our tackling technique probably dropped off at times during the game if you look at things like the pressure well done, acts Yes, the pressure acts. Geelong have Atkins and Holmes at the top. Then there's James Rowbottom for the Swans. Then it's Brad Close. Then it's Isaac Heaney. Then it's Clark, Bruin, Bowes, Stewart, and Myers. Then you've got Will Hayward. Then you've got Stanley and Mullen. So, you know, if you look at that, I'm just doing a, a rough glance at it here. You know, say the top 10 or top 15, you know, 10 of them are Geelong players for pressure acts. But then in terms of tackles, Geelong are actually 13 or 14 tackles below their season average. I think we were doing a lot of hard chasing 
But there were so many times I thought that we just couldn't stick the tackle. And whether that's through, you know, just being a bit tired, uh, just not executing properly for, for whatever reason, I think, unfortunately, some of our hardest defensive work probably didn't pay off because we weren't able to finish the job at times. I think we only had 51 tackles and our average this year is up over 60. So that was just something I noticed. I don't think we... Yeah. I was just going to say the one thought, sorry, I thought I'm trying to time it for the delay to that go, oh, he's going to finish. I'll start talking now. It just doesn't always, yeah. <laughs> doesn't always work. The thing that we did do, and this is again in def- defense of our midfield, um, like you said, I think our, our tackling technique did drop. Could have been a little more pressure at both ends for me in, in the defensive arc and the, the forward arc. But when we actually did get a, a did get it to roll into our forward 50, I think we structured up really well off the ball. When we finally got it up there, we would lock it in there and we'd we'd see it like some rush behinds and some behinds from us. And that classic thing that we ask to see almost every week of the Sydney player with doing the kick out, looking around, looking around, looking around, and then either chipping it short or having to bomb it into a contest that, that's a 50-50 contest. Mm. And that, again, to me is... I think we'd set up across the middle really well. So when they were breaking out of the middle into our back line, things were really dire. And then it was happening again and again and again. But when we could actually get it up there, I think we were structuring up defensively really well. And we were, we were locking them in there. And then there was those patches. There's really, if you look at the worm, there's really just two 10 minute patches of that game where Sydney get 80% of their score. Um, and that's not trying to take it away from them or anything, but it's just that those were the moments where we just could not. And that is where the midfield probably needs to come into it to go. We just couldn't win a center, center clearance in those moments. And then we couldn't give our forwards a chance. And then we couldn't give ourselves a chance to lock it in there. Um, and it was just really compounding this backline issue. But yeah, on the positive note, I thought when we did get it up there, we did a really good job of locking it down, which is something that I think is vital and key to our strategy going forward. Yeah. Yep. If, if you look at the end of the, the end, that, that patch of goals we gave up at the end of the second and the patch of goals we gave up across the end of the third and the start of the fourth, it's nine goals conceded in 18 minutes of total game time. It's just a team that's... And pass to you, Johnny. A bit too good for your uh, little <laughs> cats there. That's right. Just, you know, make it I will tell you, though, John, we led the game for 82 minutes. <laughs> So, but you didn't lead when it mattered the most, and no. that's right at the end. That's true. <laughs> Thirty points. Um, yeah, as you're saying, those run on goals. How do you plan? How do you think Chris Scott, your soon to be sacked coach, is going to respond to that? I mean, because you can't really suffer a it's loss brutal. that bad and not um, <laughs> expect to have some form of uh, repercussions come your way. You can have first crack at that one, Samba. Uh, well, I mean, I don't want to harp on. I was trying to think of um, a secondary thing because my my main thing is that backline structure. Whether that's figuring out Stuart, figuring out how he deals with the tag, uh, whether it's moving Stuart into the Ford Fifty <laughs> and just leave him up there, um, and put and bring someone else in. Um, like, I think that's a massive one. I think that's a massive one because, as Chris Scott said, we've got a developing midfield. And I think they're developing really nicely. I don't think they're covering themselves in shame and they all need to be dropped. I just think they're building. Now, the question will be, can we build across the next, you know, five games and get, you know, get some consistent performances, run into the finals with some really good form with danger back and, you know, actually taking it up to the best midfields? That's a question. But certainly, I think I think this is a midfield that we can move forward with into into the end of this season and, and seasons beyond. Um, but I think understanding that, that we are going to get beaten around the contest, um, around stoppages, at the moment, like it's just so vital that we are structured up and we are forcing them out wide. And this is what we were doing so well in the start of the year. And we did at times against Sydney as well, where they would put on an attack and they'd end up having to go for a kick from 50, 55 out at an angle because we, we, you know, we sort of have that wedge formation that forces their kicks out and that's where they've got to go. 
and Sydney were pretty efficient with that. So Sydney may still have beaten us from kicks in that area. They were pretty good at converting. But not every team is going to be all the time. You can kind of, uh, we've talked about it before, I think you can um, have acceptable losses from those low percentage opportunities out, out wide on the arc. Uh, it's really bothersome when teams are able just to take two, three kicks and they've got a shot from almost directly in front, 30 out. That's the thing that is uh, unlike us. Um, and I don't know if it's coming from directly from Stuart, but I'd have to assume that's a massive part of it. So we need to fix out, fix Stuart um, and how he deals with the tag, as I said. But the other thing is just getting that, getting that back line to kind of keep their head up and keep focus. I think there is a bit of defeatism in, in some of the young guys down back uh, when it's not going our way. There's a lot of complaining to the umpire and, and pointing at each other and this, this and that. Um, I think taking each contest and each forward entry at a time and when it doesn't go your way and they get a goal, focus on the next one, fix it up. Um, and that's, that's some of the things that, you know, Chris Scott in his press has said that a lot of these issues we're seeing should be overnight fixes so long as we can actually like effectively get the players to address them. So again, that's encouraging as someone that trusts Chris Scott, the fact that he's looking at those things. And I assume that those are the things he's talking about. Um, is some of those structural issues that he says there should be overnight fixes. Um, you know, that's that's encouraging. So, yeah, I don't 100% know how we fix it, Swanee, but um, I think those couple of things will go a long way. I I just wanted to bring up, too, uh, I don't want to to feel like this is, you know, crapping on players, but I, I do think it's worth bringing up that this is a little slide from our Patreon section that I just want to highlight. And it's just the difference, you know, for better or for worse, between the performances of Atkins, Bruin, Bowes, and Holmes uh, between the Tigers game and the Swans game. Because I thought it was interesting to compare because people, you know, th that was the whole thing. How will they go against a proper midfield, though? Which is not an unfair question. There is a difference between Richmond's midfields, the, the state of Richmond's midfield right now, and then playing against what Sydney are doing. I thought it was kind of telling that Atkins and Holmes were the, were the, were the least impacted. Atkins, now they, they all had down areas in their game, but Atkins was down seven disposals, down to 20 from 27. He was up 20% efficiency from the Tigers game. So he actually went at, at pretty much eight out of 10 effective disposals. Minus seven clearances. I think he was down from 10 to three. Minus four tackles, but that was from 11 to seven. Seven's a very acceptable tackle count for Tom Atkins. Minus three pressure acts from 29 down to 26. Max Holmes was down six touches, I think from 29 to 23, down 8% disposal efficiency, up one clearance, up one tackle, up 11 pressure acts. But Bruin and Bowes had some pretty big fall-offs. Minus 13 disposals for Tanner Bruin. Minus 15 disposals for Jack Bowes. Now, Bowes was up 9% disposal efficiency. Tanner Bruin was down 7.7%. Down six clearances for Jack Bowes. Down one clearance for Tanner Bruin. Down five tackles for Bruin. Down four tackles for Bowes. And each of them down half a dozen pressure acts. I, for me, the part of this question with, you know, how you pressure teams in the middle of the ground. You have to be willing to work no matter whether you're winning or losing. And I'm not saying that people didn't work at all, but it strikes me that Atkins is a player who always, he seems to impact the game more consistently, regardless of where the situation of the game is at. For me, at the moment, than Tanner Bruin. I'm, I'm, I think Jack Bowes is a player of high variance. When he's really good, he's, he's exceptional. When he's not, he's totally missing. He's sort of absent. Atkins doesn't have the same highs as either of them, but I don't think he has the same lows either. 
Max Holmes is an absolute gun. That was something that stood out for me. He did not look uncomfortable to me at the speed of the game. But I, I don't think that the way I look at it at the moment with our midfield is that Tom Atkins would be like the third or fourth rotation in an ideal world. The way Geelong would have envisaged this side going into the year was Dangerfield and Cam Guthrie. They're the two midfielders you pick first on the ball. Then you add in Atkins or Bruin, the other one on the bench. And maybe you've got Bose in there as well. But these guys are now being forced into roles probably a little bit ahead of time. Atkins probably a little bit above his skill set. Like I, I, I think he'll do it on occasion. I, I don't personally think he's ever going to be a number one mid, but I don't think we want him to be. I don't think he needs to be to be an effective player. But what you're wanting him to be is, is sort of Mr. Consistent. I, I think right now the problem for the Cats is it, it, it's like missing your two fast bowlers. And so now you're forcing medium paces to open the attack with the new ball. They're good bowlers. They're good at what they do. They are good at the things that they do. But they're not bowling 150 clicks an hour. And that's what I think we're missing at the moment with Danger. And it'd be hard for any side to miss those players. And just to add on the structure comment, there's something going on, whether it's what other teams are doing to us or just an inability for us to, to get set up how we want to but that we're still getting a lot of those frustrate, frustrated Tom Stewart moments where there's people just open in the back 50. Mm. There are so many times where the Swans had just open players, uncontested players, and you're just like, what, what is happening? Uh, I, I watched a little bit of Essendon and, and Carlton last night. Not a, not a great deal, but when those teams were going inside forward 50, it was like 1v1 matchups almost everywhere. And it was very structured. And sometimes the defender would win a spoil. Sometimes the forward would win the contested mark. It looked I thought, against Sydney. After the first quarter. The first quarter, to me, could have fit in the first seven weeks of the season. It was sort of a lot of what came after that looked more like the last, say, six weeks. A, bit, a, a little bit messy and inconsistent. Um, yeah, there's some thoughts there. I don't know if you guys you know, feel I'm being, if, if that's too harsh on on any of our players or whatever. But well, I, I, do, I do, I do wonder too, like, uh, again, it's hard to know without knowing exactly what they're doing behind the scenes. But I feel like mm. when Tom Stewart first started getting tagged, our saving grace was Zach Guthrie. And he came through and became baby Tom Stewart and was really doing Tom Stewart things. He has drifted away a bit. Is he now getting... Mm. Is he? Is this just because of the of yeah. the opposition we're playing and the and the player that he's the players that he is having to match up against, or is it something about the way we're trying to bring Tom Stewart back into the game that is actually putting Zach Guthrie back into the role he used to be? Because he used to just be a keeper, he'd play, you know, he'd be on someone and that's his man. Mm. But then when Stewart was getting tagged, Zach Guthrie was becoming that intercept defender and really like not winning his games necessarily but really saving our bacon in numerous moments within a game he, he got you know all of our mvp votes a couple of weeks there uh, mm. and he hasn't really been in the discussion as much since he's still been consistent he's not been bad but i do he just doesn't seem to be playing the baby tom stewart role he seems to be just gone back to a a a, a key back just playing his his position and staying on his man as best he can um, and so we don't really seem to have anybody playing that Tom Stewart role when Tom Stewart gets taken out of the game. And yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Do you think it's possible that they're, that they've told, you know, they've instructed Zach Guthrie to do a certain role and he's doing that and that they're trying, they're focusing. Maybe what I'm saying is, are they focusing too hard on trying to make Tom Stewart be able to do what he used to do? And it's actually disrupting our back line and we'd be better off moving Tom Stewart into the midfield or up forward and actually bringing in a, another player or moving someone down back who could be what Zach Guthrie is currently doing and put Zach Guthrie into the intercept defender role. 
It's tough too because remember Tom Stewart also had that concussion. Mm. Like Jeremy Cameron didn't come back exactly the same for a while after that concussion. Was that last season where he got knocked out by yeah. Rowan and and yeah. you know he sort of dropped off a little bit after that. Like you just don't know, I guess, what lingering stuff people are dealing with. But I was just flicking through the stats there when we were talking too. Something that's really interesting to me when you look at the Cats backline. Specifically, Jake Collajasny, Tom Stewart, um, who else was I going to look at? Zach Guthrie and Sam DeConey. Early in the season, Stewie, you know, he was consistently 80 plus percent disposal efficiency. Collajasny was going at ridiculous disposal efficiency rates, you know, 85 plus. Because I remember we talked about him in one of our Patreon player focuses that. They're using the ball so well and efficiently out of the back by foot. They're kicking so well. On the weekend, Stewart, 75% disposal efficiency. That's a low number for, for, for Tom Stewart. I'm sure if you looked at, at his best footy, that's, that's well down. Then he's the best of those defenders who would normally be marking and distributing it by foot. You have to go down to Jake Collajasny at 63.2% for the next best. Sam DeConing, 60%. Um, I, I'm, I think I've missed Zach Guthrie here. Zach Guthrie actually was, was the best of them, 76.9%. But all those players, I would say, are probably you know, not at the sort of disposal efficiency level that they were at at the start of the season. And I think we, we talked about this a couple of pods ago. Like, remember early in the season, it was like we were just playing on and kicking aggressively to the advantage of players who were running ahead of the football. It was like this slingshot attack. We'd get it and it was straight away, like, you know, a 35 meter kick and then a hand pass. And then we're out just running like a fleet of players through the middle of the ground and attacking as quickly and as aggressively as possible. I think we're seeing teams find ways to make us have to second guess our kick or go to our second or third option, and that is letting teams spoil it out, turn it over um, a lot more than the first couple of months of the season. Johnny. I like those answers. Good, good answers, I guess, for uh, sore losers. <laughs> Thanks, Swanny. We'll take it. No worries. I do have another question line. Do you want to do votes or? Yours. Yeah, do your votes and then I'll do votes for the uh, team that won. <laughs> All right, nice. nice. Um, can I quickly? Can I quickly say before we, while you bring up votes yeah. or whatever? Um, just talking about the defenders. Who did you think our best defender was from the from the day? Just to, um, just, to, just to try and be put some positives on the defense here after kind of talking about positives. not being on the, both of you, both of you, not not just Swanee, because I know it's distasteful to talk about the opposition, especially when your team had such a good day. They had a very good day. Our defenders played pretty well. Um, I haven't really, yeah, as I said, I didn't really get a chance to watch it. And I True. Don't watch Sorry. Karen, yeah. any... Forgot about that. But I, I feel like it was <laughs> I... the way you guys were talking about Zach Guthrie, I think. Feels like Zach Guthrie was up there as one of your better defenders on the day. What are you doing? I actually, I would say I was actually looking at all this stuff earlier because, again, Jack Henry was getting a bunch of hate, and we've actually forgotten. I've forgotten him talking about the back line and the disposal efficiency. He was not only our best. Uh, defender for disposal efficiency. He was our best player on the ground. 83.3% disposal efficiency. Uh, he had seven intercept possessions. A couple of spoils. He had th three contested defensive one-on-ones. He didn't lose any of them. He had one turnover. Oh, sorry. Uh, where's it gone? My, my, my page is running. One turnover, two clangers. Um, I uh, it goes against what everyone else probably thinks. I thought Jack Henry was our best. I really don't understand why people are so off Jack Henry. There's people saying that I'm done with him. 
it's time. Just got to move on. I, I thought he was our best. I thought he was yeah. the one that stuffed up the lease and the stats kind of bear it out. Well, it was a, it was a leading question, Jake, because that is that is exactly what the point <laughs> that I was going to bring up was that Jack Henry is, I thought, was out. But I thought Colin Jasny also was pretty good um, in a, a, a few, a few, especially early in the, maybe, sorry, late in the second, early in the third, maybe when the Swans were on top, I thought Colin was still doing some decent work. Um, again, a couple of times shown up because he was being asked to act without his skill set. Like he, like I said to you at one point, I was like, why are Duncan and Colin Jasny chasing Warner? <laughs> why? Like, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, highest uh, game high, I think, intercept p- possessions and intercept marks uh, for Collar. So I thought he did, he did really well as well. But I, yeah, I, I thought my eyeball test was that Jack Henry was our best defender on the day. And after looking at the stats, I feel pretty backed up on that um, by that. Um, I think he had a couple of obvious clangers, and that's what people remember. Things that like, oh, I remember when he hand-passed it straight to whoever and they set up a goal. And there was a mark. There was like one mark that he really should have taken. But th- that's two moments. And outside of that, I thought he was really consistent. I thought his positioning was pretty good. Obviously, if he beat his, you know, his defensive one-on-ones, uh, I thought he used the ball really well. I thought he was one of the few ones that actually did lead to some turnovers for us, actually kick it out effectively with speed, with pace, and set someone up to move it on. So I think, yeah, I didn't know that he was copying hate, but I just knew he would because he had those couple of turnovers. I thought he I thought he put in a really valiant performance, honestly, even when we're up against it. So, yeah, just before we got to votes, I wanted to mention him because he, he, he did miss out, but he was probably in my top five players of the, of the day. Nice. Like it. So who are your votes? Um, I am going to go Tyson Stengel uh, with my one vote. Uh, Mark O'Connor, another player who got a lot of hate, was the one of my players to miss out. But I just yeah, wanted me to too. mention that I thought he played a very, very good game. Um, probably had a weaker second half, but even then I don't think it was as bad as... And it, like... You're just saying about the one or two Jack Henry moments. Everyone is just remembering that hand pass that was mm. misdirected to Jeremy Cameron in the middle of the ground. They're not remembering everything else that he did quite well. Um, Mark, he got O'Connor, one of those so really I, early tone setting holding the ball tackles, didn't he? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Which is also the other thing, like yep. we were talking about tackle technique and stuff. That dried up. We were getting so many beautifully timed and executed tackles in that first quarter. Like it was, it was glorious. Not only were we attacking well, but when they had it, the way we smashed them uh, was, it was just, yeah, it was absolutely stunning to us and to the Swans. I think. Uh, sorry, go on. So yeah, O'Connor didn't get votes. So you were one, saying no one vote to Tyson Stengel. Obviously, a goal of the year contender, or at least it should be. He's just been so consistent. You know, in a game where you lose by 30 points, he still chimes in with three goals, one. Um, I was just trying to see if he might have even had a goal assist. He had a goal assist. He did indeed. 12 touches, three goals, one. A couple of marks, a couple of tackles. Um, he's been exceptional. He should be in conversation for All-Australian, uh, I think, uh, as one of the small forwards. He's, he's brilliant. Two votes I am giving to Tom Atkins. We talked about him already. Don't really need to go into it much more. He led the Cats in so many areas on what was a rough afternoon. Yes, he didn't get as many clearances as he normally would. There's a lot of players who could put their hand up and say that as well, but he's still, you know, 20 touches, seven tackles, three clearances, 316 metres gained, two goal assists for Tom Atkins, plus plus a bunch of pressure acts and the most effective disposals for the Cats. My three votes, though, go to Max Holmes, who would be up there as best of the season, I think, right now. I'm so glad we've got him inked to a new deal. That goal he kicked late, weaving through layers of traffic, was was very impressive. I think he's going to be an absolute star, particularly once some of these other players, Lawson Humphreys being one, is is up to the level to come into the team. I think it'll free Holmes up a bit. Um, he probably just needs a couple more heavy hitters to help him out. He can't be everywhere. 23 disposals, six marks, three tackles, six clearances, 552 meters gained and kicked a goal. And he also lifted his pressure act massively um, in a really high intensity game. 
So I like that. Sambo? Uh, same players, I believe, just, just remixed slightly. I gave my one to Atkins. Um, I gave my two to Holmes, uh, but I gave my three to Stengel. Like, I think um, to add to what you're saying, Jake Hills had five score involvements. Um, and which are which which does account, I suppose, for for the the the, the goal assist as well. Um, but I I just thought his he did some really good stuff up the ground as well. Like I, we we made that um, comment, I think it was well into the third even, where like he just hasn't stopped working. Like he was getting frustrated maybe at not getting much of a look in up in the fifty, and he roamed back and he was actually trying to lay some tackles, you know, trying to trying to put some pressure on and his he made some really good second efforts as well, I thought, um, just to try and chase, get in between it, just basically muddy up the Swans ball movement, which was really something that, you know, I think we probably didn't manage to do enough of to just, you can't necessarily lay a tackle or you can't, you know, intercept the ball. But if you can put on enough, you know, legitimate pressure, you can really play with the team's head and, and mark them up. And I thought he was, he was probably the best of our forwards for that. Um, and yeah, his goals as well. Like he's just a, an absolute freak and to, to kick three and still have a pretty good day against, against the flow, against the, you know, the, the number one team in the comp at the moment. Uh, yeah. I thought it was really impressive. I also thought Oshin Mullen did some good things too. Not enough on the stats board to like get him, Getting votes again, but I thought when he did get near it, he was really good. Um, his work rate was really good, and his kicking efficiency was 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 quite good. I think he went at eighty, which is pretty good for nine of his um, possessions being contested. So, yeah, just thought I'd give Mullen a shout out as well. Gets you got to throw a bone to some players every now and then, don't you? Yeah. Well, he he got a, he got seven intercept possessions as well, so he was he was close. I think he's equal team second. No. Yeah. Pretty good for an Irish lad. That's right. All right, I'll give my votes to the the Bloods, as I'll be referring to them. <laughs> That's how I refer to. Ah, uh, one vote. South, South Melbourne, yep. Good old South Melbourne. Go one vote there, to get a Dimmy first celebration. Um, get a Dimmy at South Melbourne. Go to the markets. All those, you know. Good things you get in South Melbourne, the crowds, then go up to Sydney, and it's just another big city. Uh, we'll go one vote. Let's go Isaac Heaney, two to Errol Goulden, and I'll give the three to the best celebrator in the game. But perhaps. Good stuff, Swanee. All right, that'll do us for the public part of the show. We are out of here. Thanks so much for watching. Thanks for listening. Until next time, go cats. Go cats. Go to bloods. (laughs) 